In the fall of 1991, Corey Fay, a resident of Portland, Oregon, began making plans for an elk hunting trip in the Badger Creek Wilderness, located just southeast of Mount Hood. The date of this trip was to be November 23, 1991, and would be Corey's fifth hunting trip. According to family and friends, he was very excited about it, and his mother always thought that Corey was born with the urge to hunt. On the evening of November 21st, Corey loaded up his truck with the necessary equipment. His grandfather loaned him a bolt-action 308 rifle that he had purchased a month before, as well as two boxes of ammo. On the afternoon of November 22nd, Corey left school early and stopped by the car lot owned by his mother and father. There he had a conversation with his parents, during which Corey talked about the last time he had went hunting and gotten lost. His mother believed he had been kidding her about that and reminded Corey to call her when he was in the Dalles, a city north of the Badger Creek Wilderness. Corey was planning to hunt with three companions. The first was Mark Malpin, who had been a family friend of the Fays for around 12 years and had been hunting with Corey three times before. Mark's father-in-law, Daryl Fincher, and brother-in-law, David Fincher, were also accompanying Corey on the trip. On the evening of November 22nd, Corey arrived at Mark Malpin's wood stove store in the Dalles, and all four men ended up spending the night there on the floor. The group got up early the next day, ate breakfast, and arrived in the hunting area around 7 a.m. on the morning of November 23rd. Corey and Mark traveled in Corey's truck, while Daryl and David Fincher were in Daryl's truck. Both trucks were parked on the east side of United States Forest Service Road 2711, just south of a nearby intersection. It was agreed that Corey would leave the keys to his truck in the exhaust pipe in case someone arrived early from hunting and wanted to get warmed up. All four headed east into the woods. After walking for several hundred feet, they broke up into two groups. Daryl and David went south, while Corey and Mark continued east. They continued on this trajectory for several hundred more feet before they too started heading south and going downhill. At the bottom of the hill, Corey and Mark then started heading uphill and into a thinned out section of woods. Corey was off to Mark's left side and about halfway up the hill when Mark last saw him. Mark continued to hunt, keeping his eyes open for Corey in the process, but at the time he was not concerned. Later on, when Mark had finished hunting, he headed back to the trucks. He had still not seen Corey, so he got into Corey's truck and began driving the roads in the area looking for him. When he returned to the parking area, he met up with Daryl and David. All three men continued to hunt while still looking out for Corey. During this time, they claimed to hear around 20 to 30 distant gunshots, some in quick succession though none of them seemed to be in the direction they believed Corey had went. Around 2 p.m., they gave up on hunting completely and solely focused on locating Corey. Dave drove around the roads in the area while Daryl and Mark looked on foot. The group found a small dying campfire near the roadside where Corey was last seen, but they could not definitively confirm Corey had built it. When darkness began closing in, they became worried that Corey was lost. Back at the parked trucks, Daryl fired two rounds from his rifle in hopes of signaling Corey and give him some bearings. At dark, they left the area and drove to Tig Valley, where they reported Corey as a lost hunter to the Wasco County Search and Rescue Coordinator. Search and rescue teams were alerted immediately and began searching the area that same evening. More than 15 agencies participated in the search, including professional trackers and search dogs. The Air Force was called in and supplied many hours of flight time using both planes and helicopters. The helicopters were equipped with heat-seeking devices. 15 square miles were grid-searched on the ground and 100 square miles were searched by air. Up to 350 search personnel were on location participating in the hunt for Corey. Three days into the search, snow began falling heavily in the higher elevations around Mount Hood. The search was not completely fruitless, however. Searchers found evidence that Corey may have built a shelter in a meadow and at least once used a space blanket that he carried. About a week into the operation, on November 29th, 
Searchers found a trail of three-day-old footprints. A deputy on the scene stated, We believe strongly they may be the tracks belonging to Corey Fay, and was probably the most significant evidence found on the entire search. The footprints matched the size and type of shoe that Corey was wearing, and were discovered two miles away from where he was last seen. The tracks were described as appearing to be those of someone wandering in an erratic manner. Later that same day, a tracker said he heard someone shouting help across a canyon in the general area where the footprints were found. The searcher twice asked the question, can you shoot? Both times the question was met with a no. A deputy on scene stated, we were never able to determine the exact origin of those noises. We checked an area extensively, but we didn't come up with anything. Late in the evening, a helicopter equipped with infrared sensors was sent to search the canyon, and reportedly detected something just before midnight. At first light the next day, a team went in and began to grid search the area, but they found nothing. Despite these rather significant developments, the sheriff's office decided to suspend the search operation by November 30th. They concluded that the voice heard in the canyon was not the voice of Corey Fay, but failed to state why they believed this. The sheriff made it clear that if any new evidence was found that indicated Corey's whereabouts, he would resume the search. It appears that this decision was at least in part due to the fact that the search was becoming costly for Wasco County. The search was quite extensive, generating a bill of more than $200,000. The Wasco County Sheriff would later say that, it is not fair that Wasco County has to pay the bill for people who come here from outside the area, are careless, don't have the proper training, and get lost. The Fays were extremely unhappy with this development, with Corey's father, Joe Fay, saying, We're not going home without our boy. We heard him cry out for help. There's tracks showing he was there. You can't just turn your back on that. The Fays subsequently put out a call for volunteers and were able to keep actively searching the Badger Creek Wilderness into December. Based on the intensity of the search effort, as well as being unable to locate Corey or even any items he had on his person, detectives were called in to investigate other possible aspects of the case. The detectives began by interviewing Corey's parents on December 1st, who told of how their son was happy, helpful, had friends, and had a job. They felt it was just not possible that he could have run away. While at the Fay residence, detectives ran into Corey's grandfather. He told them that about one week prior to the hunting trip, he and Corey had discussed what Corey should do if he ever got lost. His grandfather told him that he should stay in one place, build a shelter and a fire, and someone would eventually come for him. The grandfather told detectives he knew of no reason why Corey would want to run away and that he was a very happy kid. On December 2nd, Detectives contacted Daryl Fincher at the volunteer search camp in the Badger Creek Wilderness. He stated that after he and his son had split up from Mark and Corey, they walked south for about one hour, took a 45 degree turn to the right, and walked 10 minutes, then took another 45 degree turn to the right and walked another 10 minutes. They then began walking north towards the trucks. About halfway back to the parking location, they spotted Mark off in the distance. They unknowingly walked past the trucks and came out near the 2711 road when they saw Mark driving north on the 2711 using Corey's truck. They walked to the road and were picked up by Mark about 10 minutes later. Daryl relayed how they had hunted and searched for Corey until dark, at which time they decided to go and report him as missing. On December 3rd, two deputies went into the search area and spent the day with seven dog teams that were flown in from Ogden, Utah. The dogs were specifically trained to locate people under the most adverse conditions. They were also trained to locate dead people. The first day ended with negative results. The day of December 4th was spent with the dog teams in the field, where two teams reported their dogs had hit on Corey's scent. However, the trails led them to nothing. On December 5th, detectives interviewed David Fincher at his home in Donald, Oregon. 
He gave the same information as Mark and Daryl, but also told detectives that while he was driving the road searching for Corey, he saw a silver Dodge Dakota truck. Detectives noted that David seemed nervous during his interview with his face flushed and being visibly shaky. He also took offense to the fact that detectives had asked for Mark Malpin's rifle two days earlier, saying, if it was my rifle, you wouldn't get it. He also made the statement, I don't want to tell you anything that you could use against me later. On January 31st, 1992, Mark Malpin was interviewed by investigators regarding his willingness to take a polygraph test. At the time, Mark was reluctant due to his belief that the test was unreliable and inaccurate. Detectives reminded him that polygraphs were inadmissible in court and that it would benefit the family's uncertainty in the case. Upon hearing that the family of Corey Fay desired him to take the test, Mark agreed to do it. The results of the polygraph test are not revealed in the sheriff's report. At some point during the investigation, the Wasco County Sheriff contacted the FBI for assistance with the case. The FBI sent at least one agent who conducted independent interviews with Corey's companions and family members. It does appear that Wasco County called them because they believed there might have been some level of foul play. And Corey's grandparents went on record with a local paper on January 2nd, saying, Two weeks ago, the FBI said there was a strong possibility that he was abducted. Yesterday, they said the chances are slight, but it's still possible. They also described that the FBI was running down lists of hunters and elk permit holders known to have been in the area at the time of the disappearance. Given that the FBI was seemingly involved in a genuine investigation of this disappearance, I decided to contact them in order to try and get any records they may have regarding Corey Fay. I was surprised to eventually receive hundreds of pages of reports. The FBI, in my opinion, performed an even more thorough investigation than the Wasco County Sheriff. While it contained plenty of valuable information, the FBI also did what they often do and redact a rather large amount of material within the files, including the names of any potential suspects, witnesses, and interviewees. The report confirms that the FBI entered the investigation on the presumption that Corey was kidnapped and taken interstate. Their report contains many statements made by witnesses in the area at that time, most of the events described seem peripheral to the actual disappearance, with a few notable exceptions. Multiple hunters in the area on November 23rd and the days following claimed to hear someone calling for help, but none were able to pinpoint where they were coming from other than it seemed to come from the Badger Creek Canyon. There is another notable incident that is in the FBI report and occurred after Corey went missing. A group of hunters were in the wilderness when they heard a cry for help. As they went toward the sound, a man stepped out from behind a tree and began firing shots at the group of hunters, hitting so close to them that individuals in their group were hit with pieces of bark splinters from the trees that were hit with these rounds. They dropped to the ground and the shooting stopped. They waited a moment and then began running back in the direction they came while the firing from this unknown individual started up again. The group believed that up to three people were shooting at them in the woods. The incident was reported to authorities, but the men involved in the incident were never identified. Eventually, the FBI closed the case on Corey Fay because they had found no evidence to indicate any federal violations had occurred in his disappearance. On September 16th of 1992, nearly a year after Corey Fay went missing, a man named Carl Jurgen was bow hunting near the Gumjawak Trailhead at the north end of Badger Creek Canyon. Around 10 a.m. he located a red shirt, a red and black plaid coat, an orange shirt, and blue jeans. The items were torn and scattered about the area. He continued looking in the general location and eventually stumbled upon a blue backpack. At the time, he wondered if the items were those of Corey Fay, since his disappearance had been so widely reported in the area not even a year prior. He did not disturb any of the items and instead continued hunting. Later in the day, he returned to this location and met up with his father and another hunter. 
This hunter stated that his partner, James Glenn, had located what he believed to be the rifle of Corey Fay about one mile down the hill from the items Carl had located. While they were talking, James arrived in the area. Then the whole group went to the location of the torn up clothing. It was decided that Carl Jurgen and his father would report the find to the Hood River Sheriff's Office. Wasco County deputies showed up to the area with the Jurgens and hiked to the location of the clothing. A deputy looked through the backpack and found the hunting license and elk tag issued to Corey Fay. Deputies did a brief search of the area, but with negative results. The location of the clothing and pack were approximately 200 yards east of the Gumjoak Trail, and about a quarter mile down the hill from the entrance to the trail on Bennett Pass Road. Deputies took photographs of the items and seized the backpack for evidence before hiking back to Bennett Pass Road. Back at the trailhead, deputies met with James Glenn, who said he was involved in the search for Corey Fay, and when he found the 308 rifle, he felt it belonged to Corey. When he found the rifle, it was leaning upright against a tree with the bolt on the rifle closed. Glenn also mentioned that while he was at the site of the clothing, he found what he believed to be a human tooth. The deputies remained in the area for security until a search could be organized at first light. On September 17th and 18th, a thorough search was conducted in the area, during which more pieces of clothing were found as well as bone material, including a fingernail, a tooth, and a scapula. 300 yards from the backpack, searchers found a piece of a sock and pieces of black leather. By September 20th, the tooth that was discovered was confirmed to be that of Corey Fay by a forensic dentist. The FBI report indicates that the cause of death was likely exposure, but with so little of the remains left, it would be difficult to know for certain. The Wasco County Sheriff determined there was no evidence that suggested foul play in the case. Corey's remains were found 8 to 10 miles from the location he was last seen, and about 2,500 feet higher in elevation. To get to this location, he would have had to slog through numerous miles of deep snow. Corey's grandfather stated, I cannot believe, I just cannot believe that someone could go up in the hills all that way. I can't see how he went through that ordeal. Adding that Corey had always been trained to follow a stream downhill if he were ever lost. Corey's grandfather speculated that he must have spotted an elk and taken off after it, gotten lost, and then stricken with hypothermia. The Wasco County Undersheriff would tell news outlets that, we never speculated that he could have gotten so far. The disappearance of Corey Fay has been a case that I have invested a lot of time into. The case was big news when it first happened and received a resurgence of attention when it was covered under the umbrella of being a missing 411 case. It is clear that many people find this case bizarre, and perhaps for good reason. To me, the most peculiar aspect of this case is the distance. The fact that Corey traveled so far and in such a rough, snowy area. To truly understand this wilderness, I decided this was a location I needed to see for myself.
Hey everyone, we're here today in the Thai Valley, or more specifically, the Badger Creek Wilderness. I thought it important to come here, specifically because everyone has always asked me to do a video on the disappearance of Corey Fay, and I've always been interested in it as well. And this is the area where he disappeared. We don't know exactly when he became lost, but this is what it looks like. Thickly wooded area, lots of hills, lots of rocks. It's a dense forest. Um, I'm here in the middle of July. It's very hot, 102 degrees. He was here in the dead of winter, snow on the ground. So there's a big difference between uh, where I am right now and what it looked like when he was here. That being said, it seems like it would be a fairly difficult place to get lost in. There are a lot of forest roads going through this area, and they're quite obvious. Even with snow on the ground, it would seem like he would have had to have crossed at least one road in order to get to the valley that he went into and then traveled down for many miles before eventually perishing at the Gumjoak Saddle. Now, tomorrow our plan is to actually go to the Gumjoak Saddle, travel up the Gumjoak Trail, which is supposed to be pretty difficult, uh, but I think it's important to go see the area where his remains were found and where his rifle was found. He traveled a long distance before he died and in some pretty harsh weather. If there is something strange about this case, it's that fact. Uh, he had apparently gone hunting five times, so not necessarily the most experienced outdoorsman, but that is still a long way to go. And given that he traveled across roads and down into valley, it's just an odd thing to do. Uh, we're going to go to that area and show it to you, and you'll get to see what it looks like. The simplest way to get to the area where Corey's remains were found is to take the Bennett Pass Road until you get to the Gumjoak Saddle. Unfortunately, the road is one that requires a vehicle built for off-roading, and appeared to even be closed when I was in the area. One other alternative was to park on Highway 35 and take the Gumjoak Trail up to the saddle, and then down into the canyon where Corey's remains were found. The trail up to the saddle isn't a long one per se, but the quick elevation gain and 100 degree heat can certainly make it feel that way. This is exactly what I ended up doing. everyone, we're finally here at the spot on the Gumjoak Trail where they found Corey Fay's remains. Um, just to say, I wouldn't ever recommend someone go off trail unless you have a GPS with you to actually take you to the spot you're looking for, just so you know how to get back. And it is a little eerie actually being here after seeing the photos that the sheriffs took of uh, all the pictures out here, of the bones they found, of the gear, his rifle was found sitting up against a tree not far from here. And it, it is a bit of a strange case, but you gotta remember, I'm here in July. Corey was here in the dead of winter. There was snow on the ground. This area is incredibly steep. The camera doesn't do it justice, and the pictures you see of this area don't do it justice. There are fallen trees everywhere, and the elevation gains are just intense. If he was lost out here, even though he was close to a road, which is literally 500 feet up the trail, he could easily die out here. He, I mean, it's easy to think that he could have just gotten lost. Uh, some of the things that are interesting is that we just don't know how he died. Likely from exposure and animals scattered the remains and that's why we found his bones lying around everywhere. Uh, the rifle laying up against the tree is odd in a sense but he could have just set it down as he was preparing to die. It really is just a tragic story, and I'm not sure there's 
too much strangeness to this one. But as always, I'd like to hear everyone else's thoughts on this. It can be easy to look at the disappearance of Corey Fay with complete bewilderment. How could a young hunter, who had been taught what to do if he ever became lost, end up so far away and uphill through such incredibly rough terrain? If Corey had gone any other direction than the one he did, he would have hit a series of roads. This leads me to believe that he did not become lost in the immediate hunting area, and perhaps did follow an elk deeper into the woods. The fact that multiple pieces of evidence were found that showed Corey's path through this valley is very telling. Searchers found footprints, dogs picked up his scent, others heard a cry for help. There was evidence that Corey was wandering around lost. The real tragedy is that none of it helped to save his life. It is likely Corey discarded his gear to lighten his burden as he began trudging uphill through waist-deep snow. Unfortunately, even though there was a road on the Gumjoak saddle, it was not one that is commonly traveled, especially in winter. I know many people are probably familiar with this case from a missing 411 perspective, and I often find it valuable to examine that aspect of any given case. For example, in the book Missing 411 Western United States, David Polites outlines a series of questions to consider about this case. The questions he lists are these. Where are Corey's boots, socks, and pants? This is a valid question, but only in part. Like most of his clothing, deputies found Corey's socks and they were heavily chewed up by small animals to the point where they were in pieces. Corey's pants were also found and they were largely intact. Essentially all of Corey's clothing was found with the exception of his boots. The totality of his clothing was found strewn across a rather large area, likely scattered by animals. Where his boots ended up after all of this is unknown, but could still be in the canyon to this day. Why would Corey remove his coat? While we can't be certain that Corey did remove his coat, it is definitely a possibility considering it was found unbuttoned on the ground. A space blanket was also found nearby. It could be that Corey removed wet clothing to try and warm himself, or even a case of paradoxical undressing, a phenomenon that sometimes occurs when an individual is near death from hypothermia but suddenly begins feeling very hot. Why would Corey drop his firearm? The rifle was found sitting against a tree, purposefully placed there. That seems to indicate he simply set it aside, perhaps to focus on warming himself, or perhaps it simply became too troublesome to carry uphill. The real question I have would be regarding whether he was even able to use his firearm, due to mechanical malfunction or issues with his ammunition. Remember, the individual that searchers heard calling for help also said they were unable to shoot. Why would Corey do everything contrary to his survival training? This is a difficult question to try and answer. Firstly, we don't know where Corey was when his ordeal went from hunting and turned into survival. He could have chased an elk into the canyon and become disoriented. There is also a difference between survival training, which there is no evidence that Corey had any, and your grandfather telling you what you should do if you get lost. When actually in a survival situation, sometimes advice goes right out the window. His rifle would have been an excellent tool to use to signal help, and it is interesting that when searchers made contact with someone in the canyon, the individual said he was unable to shoot. The rifle was borrowed from Corey's grandfather, and whether Corey had ever tested it to confirm it would fire is unknown. 
Reports never indicate whether or not the sheriff's office tested the rifle to see if it was functional, though they do state that its condition had deteriorated due to weathering. The ammunition that Corey took on the trip was 30-year-old military rounds. Whether these rounds were ever tested is also unknown. Could Corey have walked three miles in waist-deep snow on a cold ridgeline? And why would he if he looked down and saw there was no snow? We know very little about what Corey did while he was lost or what he was thinking. Corey began to climb the ridge when he got to the very end of the canyon at the Gumjoak Saddle. At that point, his only option was to either climb the ridge or turn around and go back the way he had come. Perhaps he had hoped to climb up in order to get a better view of the area. We simply don't know. Why would he be 10 miles from the point he needs to be at in a one-day hunting trip? The answer to this could simply be that Corey got lost after chasing an elk. We should be under no illusions that Corey traveled all the 10 miles in one day. We have no idea how many days Corey survived out there and how far he traveled overall. The voice that searchers heard in the canyon was nearly one week into the search. Why would the sheriff summon the FBI unless there was evidence of a crime? It is likely that the Wasco County Sheriff simply wanted to rule out the possibility of a crime, and potential kidnapping was seriously and thoroughly investigated by the FBI. When a hunter vanishes so completely while with other people who are carrying weapons, it is a common thing to look at. Numerous people made anonymous statements to authorities regarding hearsay information about Corey being kidnapped. These tips, although almost always incorrect, still deserve to be investigated. The county also had limited resources to work with and could have benefited from the assistance of the FBI. I've noticed that it is not altogether uncommon for the FBI to become involved in a limited capacity when someone goes missing and is found dead on federal land as Corey was. Where are the rest of Corey's bones? A great question and also difficult to answer. There are all manner of scavenger animals located in the Badger Creek Wilderness area, including black bears and mountain lions. Over the course of a year, a lot can happen to a body that is laying deep in the woods. Still, it can be difficult to discern what a reasonable amount of bones would be. I've covered these questions to try and balance the scales in a sense, between high strangeness and conventional expectations. Can we answer all these questions with 100% sufficiency? No, nor would I expect to be able to. In cases such as these, you can almost never expect to answer all the questions left behind when someone disappears. Does this case fall into the category of unexplainable? Well, after visiting the locations involved and walking the areas, I'm still left with questions but I can see that it is plausible that this young man simply got lost and collapsed from the elements and the harsh terrain of the area. As always, I'm more curious to know what you, the viewer, think. Where does this case stand on the spectrum of what's to be expected to the bizarre? I look forward to reading your comments, and until next time, thanks for watching.